So in terms of processes, tactics, strategies for learning to love your dark skin, one of the first things you can do is understand why you don't love it. And so I'm a firm believer that in order to solve a problem, we have to understand the problem. And that includes understanding why the problem exists. Like, where did this come from? Like, how did we get here? How did I get here? How did I get to this point of not loving my dark skin? Because the baby version of you, right? Like baby Sarah was completely comfortable and at home and at ease in her skin tone, right? So there's something that happened. There were experiences, there, was, there were narratives, there were images that interfered with your relationship, your natural relationship to you and yourself and your body and your skin tone. Welcome to another weekly live session with yours truly, Dr. Sarah Webb of Colorism Healing. I do these every Monday night at 7 p.m. Central Time. And this week's topic is learning to love your dark skin. So some of you have already seen my announcement that for the month of February, February, as a celebration of both Black History Month and Valentine's Day, I'm dedicating all of my lives for the rest of the month to just lavishing dark-skinned Black women and girls with love, talking about loving ourselves, um, loving our dark skin, our hair textures, our features. And so tonight is gonna be more of like a mini coaching session where we talk about steps, strategies, approaches to cultivating that love for our own dark skin. But next week on Valentine's Day, I'm super excited about it. I've been fantasizing about it all afternoon <laughs> is I want to just have like a love fest for dark skinned girls and women and lavish them with affirmations and praise. And then so inviting people into the chat to also share love, affirmation, praise for dark skinned women and girls. So you can either come one if you want to spread the love and share your love and appreciation for dark skinned women and girls. Or if you yourself are dark skinned and you just want to come and sit and listen and read the, read the loving comments, you are more than welcome to come and do that. And yes, all of these are saved on my Instagram, my YouTube channel and um, podcasts. And I do have podcasts on all the podcast channels. So it doesn't have to be Spotify because, you know, they... Uh, got some uh, answering to do, <laughs> but it is on iTunes. It's on like Stitcher. I think that's Stitcher, um, Anchor.fm. You can listen to it on the online and that sort of thing as well. So as we get ready to talk tonight about loving our dark skin, be sure to say hello in the comments. Let me know where you're watching from. I got a, I'm in a slightly different location tonight. So I was like, oh, okay, let's try to make it a little more homey because usually I'm like I just have a plain background behind me or whatever. Anyway, um, also if you are not as familiar with me, just know that I do speaking, consulting, coaching. I publish books in terms of helping people understand colorism as well as heal from colorism. I have an international writing contest that'll be coming up soon that people can enter. And what else was I gonna say? Oh, and I offer merch. So like shirts, bags, coffee mugs, and that sort of thing. And um, I've been doing this for over a decade. So go back and browse my archives. There's a ton of content over the past 10 years or so. And, but yet I'm still taking requests for new information. Someone talked about doing a session on colorism and black churches, which is something, a particular focus I have not done yet. So still lots to talk about in the realm of colorism. Okay, I feel very chatty this afternoon, this evening. So let me come up in here and say hello to folks. I already got some badges. I got a badge from Cat Rivers. Thank you, Cat.Rivers. Um, Jendelle Crutchfield, thank you for buying a badge, sis. Um, hey, folks, come on in. Oh, I see some um, oldies, some golden oldies in the house. Uh, Brown Skin Bree from Brooklyn. Hey, Brown Skin Bree from Brooklyn. 
I'm planning to check out Brooklyn. I've heard good things about it. Even from people who are from the Bronx have said good things about Brooklyn and apparently like y'all are rival neighborhoods or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just over here in Harlem still in this one little neighborhood discovering lots of new things. There's so much in the New York City area to see and enjoy and appreciate just in everyday life. So um, Pennsylvania, this is Savannah Christine. What's up, Savannah Christine, Pennsylvania? Not too far from NYC, all us East Coasters. Uh, we got Dallas, Texas in the house, Jandell Crutch, who is, Jandell Crutch, by the way, I often call her Jandell Clutch, okay? Because she's my big sister and she has come through for me many, <laughs> on many occasions. Um, this is Abduan Yang 300. Again, screen names are sometimes typical for me on these lives, especially since they don't have spaces and in them all the time. So never hesitate to correct me if I do not pronounce your screen name correctly or if there's a, another name you prefer to call me as well, just let me know in the chat. But it says, hi, I'm from Karim. I'm Karim. Oh, hey, Karim. So there you go, Karim from Senegal. Currently living and studying in Japan. Well, hello. Do you follow... Oh my gosh, I don't know her screen name, but there's like a, a beautiful black sister on Instagram that I've been following for a while and she's in Japan. So I don't know if you follow any of her content, but she talks about being black in Japan every now and then. She has a YouTube channel and stuff too. So hello. Um, Carissa knows it. Absolutely love your platform from Boston. Woohoo! Hey, East Coast in here deep. <laughs> but thank you, Carissa. Um, yay. I just moved here from Texas and it's been amazing. So much culture to appreciate, right? Yes. Uh, my sister who I was just shouting out lives in Dallas. We're originally from Louisiana though. So shout out to all the places, all the places around the world. Love you, love all y'all. <laughs> hey, Belly Bela. Hi, hello. I, I'll be in and out. Sorry to be rude. You're not being rude. There's no, you know, um, requirement to stay for a particular amount of time. I'm just glad that you showed up at all. Like I say, just to, anybody who clicks on that little circle, I'm honored that you even clicked on the circle. <laughs> um, Cat Rivers says, I'm from VA living in NYC. Look forward to catching a live event. Hey, what's the, all these people moving to NYC? Must be a sign. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I said I was chatting tonight, and obviously I am. <laughs> hey, Laren Alta, what's up? Y'all, Laren has a, a really good podcast. She brought me on there once last year, so make sure to go back and check the archives, but also follow going forward as well. All right, I said hello to all my folks, and hello to everyone who didn't type anything in the chat, but who's still watching. I love y'all too. So let's get into learning to love your dark skin. So last week, I talked about the impact that colorism can have on self-esteem for dark skin girls and dark skin women, dark skin femmes, and really just acknowledging that colorism does damage. And yes, people sometimes go too far with making colorism only be about self-esteem, the good thing about my platform is that I have the space and the freedom to talk about the self-esteem stuff, but also talk about the structural violence of colorism, talk about the systemic inequality of colorism, right? And so in my very first live of the year, I mentioned how as the year progresses, I'm going to sort of expand and branch out. But I wanted to start the year off by really focusing on our personal, psychological, spiritual well-being, right, as individuals looking at our individual biases, our individual internalized colorism and that sort of thing. And so I'm really gonna stay in this space for several more weeks um, because it's really at the heart of what I, what I do, right? Because I, I do talk about the systemic stuff, but I think my bread and butter in terms of fulfillment, the fulfillment in doing this work is when people say in the comments or they message me or they tell me on a Zoom meeting, that their personal life has changed, right? That they um, are happy that these conversations are just making them feel better and helping them to understand things about themselves and their past. So I really just appreciate that space. And I didn't have it when I was coming up, right? <laughs> so 
I uh, am also doing it for me. Let's be honest. <laughs> I'm fulfilling my own spiritual needs <laughs> by offering this content. Um, so that was last week. And so this week I want to kind of talk about how we can start to heal, start to learn to love ourselves. And I have blog posts, just FYI, I have blog posts that I write along with all of these live streams. So if you want to read, consume this content by reading it, that there's a place for that. Again, watching the videos, so many different forms. And so as I was writing and preparing for tonight, I thought about micro self-love and macro self-love, you know, because I just be thinking about stuff and this came to my mind. I was like, okay, so I kind of see macro self-love as I just love myself completely, like all of me, everything about me, just this holistic self-love, right? But then I also think about micro self-love as loving specific parts of ourselves, right? So like micro self-love is like, oh, I love my hair specifically. I love my eyes specifically. I love the way I laugh specifically. I love um, the texture of my skin. I love the freckles on my face or the, I don't know, the way my toes are straight instead of crooked or whatever, or vice versa. And I, I think that we can have one without the other. So often I see us having, for example, macro self-love, but not, but struggling to love one specific thing about ourselves, right? The macro part. So I know a lot of people, they have like a really solid sense of self-love, but they struggle to love their natural hair, right? So they, in the macro sense, they have really high self-love, but on the micro scale, looking at specific parts that they still struggle to love. And then vice versa, we probably all know someone, if it hasn't been us ourselves, where we might love those individual things. Like, oh, I love, you know, my height. But just in general, I just struggle with self-confidence and self-love and self-esteem. Or for people who, um, a lot of dark-skinned girls who have been praised for their hair texture, right? They're like, oh yeah, I, I know that I have the quote-unquote good hair, but I still don't feel good about myself. Even though it's easy for me to love specific features that are accepted in society. And so we can have the micro and the macro together. We can have one without the other. We can have neither of them, right? So there are also cases where not only do we not love ourselves in general, but we struggle to find even one aspect of ourselves to really celebrate and appreciate. So I think starting with loving your dark skin is kind of a micro approach to the self-love thing. And I don't think there's a prescribed way to start. I think the journey of self-love starts wherever you are, right? So wherever you are, in terms of how full your self-love meter is, is totally fine. But because I talk about colorism so much, I thought it was worthwhile to focus on that one particular aspect of loving our dark skin. Because again, a lot of dark-skinned women really do love themselves, even if they're struggling to love this particular feature of themselves. Um, so, as we proceed, I, I wrote this as well, just as a precursor to the self-love conversation, which is the, the role of our egos, okay? The role that, uh, that our egos play in our life in general, but in the healing process in particular. So the human ego has its purpose. It really does. The human ego has kept us safe or seemingly safe from a lot of things. Our human ego is what um, makes us go back and ask for the right change. If someone gives us the incorrect amount of change, our ego might say, oh, okay, I in this moment will go and um, ask for the right change because I deserve that, right? <laughs> But when it comes to the healing process, our egos are really not our friends in the healing process, okay? Um, our egos, for example, will try to convince us that there's nothing wrong. Our egos will try to convince us that, oh, we don't need to look at that because you're fine. Look at you. You have a nice house. You have a nice car. You know, you have a boyfriend, you have lots of famous friends, you, you're fine. Why dig up that old trauma? Why go there? 
We do, we like the front. We like the pristine Instagram version of you. So let's just leave it at that, right? And so the ego is, I don't want to say an arch enemy of healing, <laughs> but sometimes it kind of feels that way, right? And we like to protect the idea, the narrative of ourselves as being great. Similarly, people's egos prevent them from acknowledging how they've been complicit in perpetuating colorism, right? I think about, so to, to pause from focusing on dark-skinned women a little bit, when light-skinned people refuse to acknowledge their privilege and how they've been complicit and participated in oppressing darker-skinned people, a lot of that is the ego can't withstand the pain of recognizing that you have caused people harm even though your idea of yourself is someone who's progressive and someone who fights for marginalized groups of people, right? And so if your healing requires you to recognize something about yourself that's inconsistent with the narrative, with the image and the idea you have of yourself, then your ego will resist it every time. So for all my dark-skinned sisters out there who I've heard say, for example, well, I'm dark-skinned and it, it never bothered me, or I'm dark skinned and you just looking for something to be mad at. Or all the dark skinned sisters who say, oh, you know, who, who take on that sort of unbothered, unfazed persona, right? That is a lot of ego, right? And again, it's not because ego is inherently evil or bad, but it's not going to facilitate your healing process or your healing journey. Okay. So I'll say that for my dark skinned sisters, it's okay to say I've been hurt and it's okay to say I am hurting. And I want my dark skinned sisters and my dark skinned brothers too, because I know y'all, some of y'all are listening as well. It's okay to not be strong, particularly for dark skinned people who are constantly perceived as the strong ones and who are expected to be strong. It's okay to say, mm, I don't feel like I can get through this on my own. It's okay to say um, that I struggle with self-love. That's okay if you are there. Um, I don't know why we have a stigma in our society about struggling with self-love, right? I feel like there's a stigma about people who struggle with self-esteem. And you hear things like, oh, well, you sound weak. Someone actually said that. Someone left a comment. I can't remember if it was on YouTube. I forgot what platform it was. But someone was like, talking about this makes you look weak. It was probably TikTok, to be honest. Because <laughs> that's the kind of stuff you get on TikTok. Um, talking about this just makes you look weak. And um, those stigmas, those kinds of projections and that those that kind of judgment that people pass on folks who are trying to engage and talk about their painful pasts or their own journeys with self-esteem, that kind of judgment makes people afraid to one, seek help and to even acknowledge that they might need help, right? It's because, oh, I don't want to be perceived as weak. So I'm just going to like suck it up and pretend like nothing's wrong because I don't want someone to look at me and say, oh, well, you're weak. You can't handle it, right? Like if you loved yourself, well, something's wrong with you because you wouldn't care about colorism if you loved yourself. And this is like real judgmental thing. Like mm, what's wrong with you? Like you are less than, you're bad. You're broken or defective because you can't be like me and just like not be bothered, <laughs> I'm going to keep it real with y'all. Um, also, another form of ego that gets in our way as dark-skinned women from fully embracing the process is when we compare ourselves to other people and we say, oh, well, at least I'm not that. Well, at least, for example, if I was struggling with self-esteem and I were to say, well, at least I'm not afraid to wear my natural hair. At least I'm not as bad as that, Right? Like that mentality would actually prevent me from developing the, the levels of self-love that I desire to reach and deserve to reach, right? And so it's not about, well, at least I don't, at least I don't um, 
At least I don't. At least I'm not chasing a man. So all the ways that we try to protect our own ego by passing judgments on other people when really it's a projection of what I would judge myself for, what I'm most likely to judge myself about. Um, so I'm going to move on from that because I don't want to, well, I don't mind making all of us a little uncomfortable, but I want to get to some of the, the more warm, gooey stuff as well. <laughs> All right, I saw a few comments come through. This is a good time to pause and read those. Hi, Coco Nia. Welcome. If you're just joining and you want to say hello, please do that. Let me know where you're watching from. Cat River says it's deep. I try to get deep. I try, you know. Um, Mango Steamberry says, oh, Tandy. I had a friend like that who would say I'm dark and it didn't bother me. But now she has a daughter who is going through it. Now she gets it. Absolutely, mango steam berry. A lot of I hear that scenario a lot where having children shifts people's perspectives in ways that they didn't couldn't otherwise shift on their own before having children. Um, let's see. Yes, all right. I'm living in Saitama. How about you? I'm in currently in New York City in Harlem. I have not been to Japan. I will shall have to check it out. <laughs> all right, so let's continue. Okay, I think I got all, all the comments. I thought there were more than that. Joining from Toronto, my Kimin, or Kimin, I feel like that's pronounced Kimin, but I could be wrong. All right, so in terms of processes, tactics, strategies for learning to love your dark skin, one of the first things you can do is understand why you don't love it is to have the courage to kind of look back and reflect on your life experiences that have hindered or impeded or made it difficult for you to love your dark skin. And so I'm a firm believer that in order to solve a problem, we have to understand the problem, right? It's not comfortable. It's not um, the sort of kumbaya uh, what do people call it? Toxic positivity, right? Like, oh, nothing's wrong. I'm just gonna, you know, ignore all the problems and focus on only the good. But I think whether we're talking about colorism at the systemic level or just our own personal healing, we have to understand the problem itself. And that includes understanding why the problem exists. Like, where did this come from? Like, how did we get here? How did I get here? How did I get to this point of not loving my dark skin? Because the baby version of you, right? Like baby Sarah was completely comfortable and at home and at ease in her skin tone, right? So there's something that happened. There were experiences, there, was, there were narratives, there were images that interfered with your relationship, your natural relationship to you and yourself and your body and your skin tone. Because again, all babies are born being very comfortable with who they are in their skin. And so here are some questions that I encourage you to journal. And yes, please go get a journal. <laughs> for now, depending, so also you have to be ready for your, this healing process because the healing process is very painful. And sometimes it's so painful, you. It feels like the wound all over again. And so that can be confusing. So I'm offering these, but if you don't rush your process, don't rush your process. If you just want to listen and you'll get a journal next year and actually start thinking about these questions, that's totally fine. You're going to get something just by hearing these questions. But for anyone who's sort of at a point where you feel a little courageous enough to really go there, I encourage you to actually start writing in response to these things. I don't know, I feel like I have to <laughs> um, belch. I know that's T TMI, but I just ate like two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So excuse me while my body is trying to digest my lunch, my dinner. <laughs> um, okay, so some journaling prompts or questions for my dark skin sisters out there who want to start to understand why? How did I get to a point where I don't feel completely comfortable in my beautiful dark complexion. One question is, do you actually see dark skin as unattractive or ugly? Is that actually what it is? 
okay? Is it that when I look at my own dark skin, when I look at other people's dark skin, I don't like it. I think it is unattractive or ugly. Is that where you are? Or, 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 do you struggle to love your dark skin, not because you don't think it's beautiful, but because you see it as a chain that holds you back in life? Is your struggle to love your dark skin more so about how it actually looks to you? Or is it more so about your perceptions of how it limits the way you move through the world. And I think that's a really helpful distinction to know for yourself. And again, the benefit of doing this in a journal is nobody has to know what it is. Like nobody has to know, nobody but you has to know these answers. Um, and so think about barriers to things that you desire. And so for a lot of people, a lot of dark skinned women, it's not that will say it's not that I actually dislike dark skin or that I think I'm ugly, but my pain, my wounding is in knowing that because I'm dark skin, I don't receive the affection that I want, that I long for. Or because I'm dark skin, um, I'm, I'm invisible to certain people. I'm invisible to employee, employer, employers or to friendship circles. Or... I've been kept out of certain opportunities, right? And so I think that can be an, a useful distinction for yourself because then it informs what you do next, right? Like knowing that, like if, if you are at a place where you really just don't like the look of dark skin, there might be different strategies you use to overcome that versus struggling to love your dark skin, not because of how it looks, but because of the, the ways that it's impacted how other people treat you and the opportunities you feel you've lost because of that, right? And so then another question we can ask is how do you feel about your dark skin versus other people's dark skin? And so this is sort of like um, when people say, oh, I like natural hair on you, but I don't think I could pull it off, right? And some of things similar is, well, when I look at other, I see lots of other beautiful dark skinned women and lots of other beautiful dark skinned people, but I just wish I wasn't dark skinned. I don't think it looks good on me, right? And so being clear about when you say you don't love your dark skin and when you think about the fact that you struggle with it, like getting really clear about what's the particular struggle that you have with it. Another question you can ask if you're journaling is, is my feelings towards my own skin, is it tied to family issues? Is it tied to childhood trauma or maybe even generational cycles of trauma? Not necessarily, you know, direct abuse that I experienced, but maybe my grandmother experienced abuse. And so I'm, you know, living out some of that inherited trauma versus, you know, growing up in a household that was actually very affirming and very loving of my dark skin but in, on the playground, at school, or in classrooms, or at work, or at college, or in local community is where I started to pick up that I was perceived as less than other people, or where I started to realize how my skin tone impacted the way people treat me and see me, right? And let's see one. And so the reason why I say to write these things down is one, it gets it out of your head, right? And so it, it can literally help you get out of your own head to actually write it down. And it's harder to go down a negative thought spiral if you're actually writing these things down or externalizing them in some way. Because if you just leave it in the realm of thought, it's easier to trick yourself. It's easier to like, y'all, we've had those thought spirals. I know I've had thought spirals. I'm like, why can't I stop thinking about this thing? And so actually not relying just on the, the voices in your head, but actually writing stuff down helps you externalize it enough sometimes to where you can step back and see what's there. All right.
I have a couple more things on this. We're at 7.28. Okay, I'm not doing too bad on time. I'm trying to keep it, keep them to 30 minutes, but maybe I need an extra 10 minutes. Let's see. I think I had um, Meyer Ban Oasis. Dr. Webb joining from Louisiana. What's up, Louisiana? <laughs> Hometown. Black girls are God. Do you actually see dark skin as unattractive or ugly? Do you struggle to love your dark skin not because it's not beautiful, but because you have to you have, you see it as a limit on how you move through the world? Yes, thank you for typing those in the chat. Oh yeah, thank you for recording the questions in the chat. <laughs> that will probably help a lot of people. All right. So then the other thing, the other side of that coin, right? To so unpacking the the problem, understanding your obstacles, what has kept you from loving your dark skin in the past. The other side of that coin, that healing process, is being able to imagine what it would be like if you loved your dark skin. And so, yes, we have to look at the problem and understand it, but then we also have to understand where we're going, where we're headed. Because when we say we're on a healing journey, a journey implies that there's a goal, right? That there's a vision of something that we're working towards. And so that vision is also an important part of the healing process, learning to love your dark skin. And as dark skin, as a dark skin person myself, I'll say, I know sometimes hope hurts. I said that in a poem once. I was like, hope hurts. Because I talk about colorism through the lens of heartbreak a lot of times. And if you watch my TED Talk, you might know where I'm going with this. But colorism is a form of heartbreak. And as a dark-skinned girl, as a dark-skinned woman, the constant disappointments associated with colorism, the constant letdowns make you not want to get your hopes up. They make you... They make it scary to dream of something more. And when you're, you've constantly been disappointed, you've constantly been rejected, you've constantly been let down, you've constantly been told no, you've constantly had doors shut in your face just because of the color of your skin. It can be scary, it can be hard, it can be painful to let yourself get your hopes up again. It can be scary to dare to dream of something better for yourself. And that's in the realm of healing but we know that that's also in the realm of just life's opportunities, right? Do you dare to dream that you can live your dreams because of the ways I've been shut out from things I desired in the past just because of my skin tone or the way people perceive my skin tone? Um, so I, I acknowledge that this part of the healing process makes us very vulnerable. When you have a wish or a desire or you long for something or you have a goal and you actually say, oh, this is something I want, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position. It's vulnerable to dream, especially the bigger the dream, the more vulnerability it takes to let yourself go there, to let yourself imagine the the dream career to let yourself imagine the relationship of your dreams to let yourself imagine um traveling the world or wearing the clo wearing the clothes and the red lipstick that you desire to wear and being happy and free in that in your skin whatever your dream is it's a vulnerable thing to dream and the more you've been hurt in the past, the more you've been heartbroken in the past, the harder it is to let yourself be vulnerable again. We hear stories, for example, of people who are afraid to love again because they've been heartbroken. And I think dreaming is similar. Sometimes it's scary to dream again because all the dreams I've had were have been dashed. I've been told no or shut out of a dream in the past. And so it's hard sometimes to let ourselves go there. Um, but I encourage you to start small, start with the, the small dreams. And again, the beauty of this is that you can keep it totally private. Nobody but you and your inner child and your future self <laughs> have to know 
that you have this dream. Um, but here are some things, some simple, really practical prompts you can ask yourself in your journal or your, even if you do like a digital thing or you record yourself talking about this stuff. Um, what emotions would you have if you loved your complexion? What kinds of emotions would you feel in your body? And then actually try to feel them in your body as you're thinking about it. How would you dress or style yourself if you loved your dark skin? Would you wear pink more often? Would you wear yellow more often? Would you show more skin if you loved your skin? All right, so start to imagine what that would look like for you. Another thing to kind of contemplate and reflect on what kind of relationships would you have? And this one, I like this one because, again, similar to heartbreak in the romantic sense that can close you off and influence the way you show up in other future relationships, the same can happen with the heartbreak of colorism. The heartbreak of colorism, because I said, I said this, I had a, a transparent moment last week if you want to get all of my business, last week I opened up a little bit about how my experiences with colorism influenced the way I showed up in terms of interacting or engaging with men. And because of the explicit disdain or the explicit um, like ridicule and rejection that I experienced, especially you know amongst Black men, I had the narrative that, well, I'm not even going to try, right? And so that impacted the way I showed up in the company of other men, right? But it's not just in that, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up, but it's not just in the romantic sense. Friendships. How would your friendships with other women be different if you loved your dark skin? Would you no longer defer to them as the authority on certain topics? Would you no longer defer to them as, um, I don't know, deserving the door prize? Oh, oh, you got a door prize. Well, you should have it, you know? In your family relationships, especially if your family contributed to your pain in terms of colorism, if you started gradually to learn loving your dark skin, how would you show up to family gatherings differently, right? Just things to imagine, start to imagine them, right? You don't have to have like a very clear definitive answer because obviously you won't know until you get there, but you can start to imagine these things. Um, and related to relationships, what kinds of conversations would you have if you loved your dark skin? How would you talk to yourself? How would you talk to other people? Thinking about all the things we say when we struggle with that self-love, when we don't like our dark skin. Some of them I shared last week, you know, the, the comments we make in passing, like, oh, I better not spend too much time in the sun. Do you catch yourself saying that? What do you catch yourself saying? And how would that change? How would that talk to other people and to yourself be different if you were learning to love your dark skin? And then, um, last couple of questions. How would you move differently? And, you know, I'm, I don't really know. Like, I, these, these are questions I would need to go back and reflect on even for myself. But how would you move differently? Would your posture be better? I have bad posture. <laughs> Slouching. Um, would your posture be better? Would you um, be more open and free in your movements, right? In your physical movements, but also like you know, in terms of how the moves you make in the world, right? So yes, how you move your body, but then also what kind of moves you make in the world. Would that change for you? Would your career path change? Really think about it, folks, because go back to my live last week and you'll, you'll, if you didn't catch it, you'll understand why I'm asking these questions. Because struggling to love your dark skin is not just about your ability to view yourself as pretty. If you struggle to love your dark skin, chances are your limits, you've been limiting your life path in so many ways. And I talk about, you know, dark skin girls or dark skin people in general who have internalized colorism. Yes, they might struggle to see themselves as beautiful, but they might also struggle to think they deserve better. 
They might also struggle to think that they're going to get the promotion. They might struggle to think or believe that they can be a YouTuber. Like for real, they might struggle to believe that they can be a social media influencer who makes a living on brand partnerships and brand deals. Like, so really even your career path could be influenced by negative beliefs that you have about what's possible for you with your dark skin. And this is not saying that just because you love your dark skin that you stop experiencing colorism, right? Because that's the thing too. So let me be very clear that even as we start to love our dark skin and we start to change our narratives about what's possible for our life, we will still encounter resistance. We will still have people who reject us because they're colorist, right? But then, but we'll get to a place where that those rejections do not diminish our belief that acceptance is possible, right? Being not chosen for a job, we'll still, we'll still be able to believe that we can have a beautiful, wonderful career, right? And so this is not to say that those experiences of colorism happen because you didn't love your dark skin. Y'all already know what time it is with that. <laughs> I ain't on that at all. Um, but I do know that when we internalize these things, we do at times also limit ourselves for fear of that rejection going forward. Okay, so I feel like I need to, I, I wrote more in this blog post, <laughs> but I feel like that's a good place to end. Um, and I'll pick back up with the rest of my blog posts going forward. Uh, I do see another badge. Let's see. This one is from Modern Formulas. Thank you for buying a badge, Modern Formulas. You said, that is my story completely. I just stopped dating men altogether. Girl. <laughs> Cha. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, I could talk to you for a while about that. And I probably will. I probably, I am going to start talking more about my experiences with dating and how colorism has played a part in that in the past and going forward in the present. Um, but yeah, I have to leave you all with the self-reflection and the affirmation for today. And again, just a reminder that next week is all affirmation. So a lot of times I teach, I am a teacher. Like I just, I'm not a professor anymore. I quit my job as a professor. I used to teach high school. I don't do that anymore. So I'm not like a formal teacher, but I, it's always a part of what I do. It's always a part of how I show up in the world. It's a part of my all my platforms. There's an element of teaching. And so sometimes like tonight, it's real teachy and like it's kind of like coaching and there are tips and strategies. Um, but next week, there's no teaching. It's just all affirmation. Like, I'm just going to be saying expressions of love, saying lovely things to my fellow dark skinned sisters. And I'm going to have people encourage people in the comments in the chat to also say lovely things and to also write affirmations in the chat. And I'll read those out loud so that they're preserved on video form. If you want to, if you can't attend the live stream, but you want to send me a DM or leave a comment talking about why you love dark skinned black women and girls, why you love yourself as a dark skinned black woman and girl, I can, I can read those in the live as well. So really it's going to be like um, a half hour to 45 minutes of just like saying dope stuff about dark skinned girls and women, just like all affirmation the whole time. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to that. I am looking forward to that. I'm trying to think about like how I can incorporate music without copyright infringement on if I, cause I'll share it to YouTube afterwards or whatever. Um, so I might just get like some royalty free beats from the YouTube uh, library that I can keep with the recording. But for now, I'll leave you all with the reflection. And for you all dark skinned women who are thinking, considering moving forward on your healing journey, ask yourself the question, are you ready to start the process of learning to love your dark skin or your natural hair or your features or your whole self in general? That's, it might seem like a really simple question, but one, it's okay if you're not ready to do that work yet. That's totally okay. Um, keep listening. 
keep following the pages that talk about colorism. And eventually you that day will come when you know like, oh yes, I am ready to, to do more of this work. And then what's one action you can take today towards that healing goal? And your affirmation for tonight, for this evening, um, I am preparing myself to remove the mask of my ego and start my healing journey. It can be scary, but I can be brave. Yes. All right, my dears. Um, I hope this helps, you know, some dark skinned person out there uh, feel a little bit better about where they are and also feel a little more empowered to make, to evolve and to continue to grow and work on their inner peace and their inner love and joy. I love y'all so much. Will you be my Valentine? Will you all be my Valentine on for next week? I, uh, I don't know. I'm just really excited that my next live stream falls on Valentine's Day. <laughs> so excited about that. It's perfect. It's perfect. I love that. I'll be live with you all on Valentine's Day, should you choose to join. I know other folks might have plans already or might not want to spend their Valentine's Day listening to this live. But I feel like even if you have other plans, like you could add this live stream to your plans. Because I, again, it's going to be just chock full of loving affirmation to all the dark skinned women who I really do love. Like I, I would love to have you all be my Valentine's on February 14th, 2022. Um, thank you. Blessed to be a blessing 10. I love that screen name. Y'all have such cool screen names. Oh my gosh. Thank you for buying the badge. And thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to everyone who clicked on the circle, even if you hopped right back off. <laughs> I know I've done that on lives before. Sometimes I, I like click on a circle just to see what's going on. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I can't listen to the whole thing. <laughs> um, but especially, especially to those of you who stayed for any amount of time and tried to listen, tried to engage. Uh, I love y'all. That's why I want y'all to be my Valentine's because I love y'all so much. And this work is all about y'all. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for y'all. Well, it helps me too, though, again, like that I found that doing colorism healing has been part of my healing journey as well. And on that note, y'all, enjoy the rest of your week. I hope it is filled with laughter and fun and rest and care and love. And until, until Valentine's Day, folks, take care. Bye. Mwah.